I guess we'll go ahead and start. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Richard Montgomery, Legislative Director for the MSBA, and welcome to another edition of Coffee and Conversations with Legislators. And today's installment features Senator Bobby Zirkin uh, introducing a gentleman who is we, we're very lucky to have with us today, and that is Douglas Peters, who uh, served in the Maryland Senate uh, starting in 2007, representing District 23 in Prince George's County until his departure last month uh, when he was appointed to the University of Maryland System Board of Regents. Uh, Senator Peters served as the chair of the Capital Budget Subcommittee of the Senate Budget and Taxation Committee, where previously he had served as vice chair. Uh, he's, he's a local guy, uh, Marylander, uh, attended Springbrook High School and received his undergrad degree and MBA from the University of Maryland. Uh, served as a captain of the U.S. Army Reserve and served in Operation Desert Storm, uh, where he received the Bronze Star. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to turn this over to former Senator Bobby Zirkin, uh, who will who will uh, engage with Senator Peters, and we'll have a very interesting morning. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning, Senator. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, so very excited on behalf of the Maryland State Bar Association to have our latest installment of uh, Coffee and Conversation with Legislators. And this one is with a now former legislator, Doug Peters, uh, my close friend in the General Assembly and uh, a big loss for the Maryland State Senate. Uh, but uh, certainly, as Richard said, moving on to the University of Maryland uh, Board of Regents, which we're uh, going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, we're going to cover a whole lot of topics today, but uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, talk about, uh, Doug, if I could, was to start with, tell us about what you're doing now and, and, and how that decision, you know, kind of how that decision all came about. It was, it was within the news within the last month, so, so go ahead. So you're no longer a senator, now going to the Board of Regents. <laughs> um, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, and uh, I'm very interested in any questions anybody has, particularly about the budget. I know that there's not a budgeting, a lot of budgeting that goes on during a law school and in the practice, but um, you know, there are a lot of attorneys who run their own shops and they've got to, you know, learn, learn by drinking from the fire hose about setting up the books and billing and, and all that, which I think is a critical part of a successful firm. So, um, you know, I've been a small business owner for 40 years. Uh, the thing I really liked about the Senate was that you could go back to your business after you did your 90 days. Now, granted, you know, as, as you know, Bobby, um, there are events you have to go to, you know, that go out to see the citizens outside the 90 day period. But what I really liked was people like you and others, farmers, you know, teachers that would go out into the world and practice their profession and then come back into the Senate for 90 days. And I think, honestly, I think that's what our forefathers really envisioned when they first started the country. You know, now everything's a full-time job. And, um, but I, that's what I loved about the Senate, the traditional part of it. So I didn't make any transition. Uh, I have a business. I just went back and, you know, have more time to focus on the business. Um, and uh, that's the beauty of it. So uh, what happened was that um, I had served uh, 23 years at the city, county and state level. Um, and I got to a point where um, I wasn't gonna run again. And so I wanted to really have um, the opportunity to um, appoint somebody to the seat who I felt would be a good solid representative. And currently, you know, the Democratic Central Committee appoints your successor. And um, that person's been appointed, Ron Watson. Um, and then a delegate would get appointed. And, you know, he was a top vote getter in the district. I think he would have won the election anyway, but, you know, give him a head start. Um, redistricting was coming up, which is very important. And I think he needed to have a voice there. Um, and also, you know, an election coming up. Uh, so it was the right time to go. Um, it was, I was thankful I was able to help point that person. Um, and, um, you know, I always wanted to serve on the Board of Regents. I was, you know, as you know, I went attended Maryland College Park. Um, and um, it was 
a, a meeting with the governor after session in April, you know, where I told him, look, I'm not going to run again if something comes up for the border region. If a spot comes up, I'd appreciate it. And, you know, he said he'd think about it. And two weeks later, I got a phone call saying that that, that was a uh, open July 1st. So I kind of had to scramble a little bit because, you know, you have to shut your office down and turn over. And I've made that whole transition, which is great, seamless, you know, um, with my staff. Everybody's fully employed, and, and um, one of my staff members is going to work for, you know, Senator uh, Watson. So um, that was important to me as well. But the interesting thing is that um, higher ed is extremely complicated. You know, there's we oversee the 12 public schools. Uh, hey, and, let, me, um, let me interrupt you for one second. Take a step, just one small step back for those who yeah. don't know what the Board of Regents does can you can you kind of just get, give an idea because you have moved from being a very powerful state senator into into going into the board of regions and, and so that's an interesting step um what does the board of regions do i know you were kind of about to start talking about the different systems i, I think that would be of interest sure sorry uh there you know there's 21 of us not two or two are students um we're we're very um geographically you know appointed um and um demographically appointed. And so I'm the only full-time regent from Prince George's County. Um, and the two students are from Prince George's County as well, or attend, you know, schools, College Park and Bowie State. Um, so we oversee the 12 higher institutions, you know, Frostburg, Salisbury, University of Maryland, uh, Coppin, et cetera. And um, we, the chancellor reports to the board of regents. The chancellor oversees the 12 presidents. So what's interesting is, you know, in a couple months, we will appoint a new president for UMBC, you know, Dr. Valsky's retiring. Right. So that'll be interesting because it's, you know, I've, I've only been on there a month and we're gonna appoint a president. That's probably one of the most important things we do on the board. Uh, so, the, each of us were on committees, so I got assigned to finance, of course, because I was on budget tax. Um, I'm also on the um, intercollegiate committee, which is very interesting because, you know, athletics, uh, young, young people are getting uh, endorsements now. Right. And so that should be fascinating, in my opinion, you know, on how some of these young athletes are going to get um, endorsements and funding how that works with colleges. Yeah. Um, and I'm also on advancement. And I just recently got appointed to the University of Maryland Medical System. So three regents actually sit on the University of Medical System board. So I'm also on the University of Mar Maryland Medical System board. So I, uh, I'm kind of like not really retired, obviously now. <laughs> There's uh, two boards going on and I'm on another couple boards. So I enjoy it, it's something I love, and I'm looking forward to it. It's really fascinating. So in addition to, before we get off of the Board of Regents, because I am interested, particularly the, the legislature just this past year passed legislation that other states have, have done as well, dealing with intercollegiate athletics and athletes being able to get endorsements. And that, what, if you know, since you're just getting started, what role does, does the Board of Regents have in that? I, I would imagine it's got a, in some ways be an overseer to make sure that there's no, you know, quote, funny business going on. And, you know, you, you can imagine scenarios of getting athletes to schools in, in interesting ways now um, at some of the bigger, particularly football schools. So like, does the Board of Regents have any play in that or are you too fresh to, to, to know how, how you guys would deal with that? Well, I haven't, we haven't had our meeting yet, but I've, I've already gotten some idea of what we're, you know, first of all, obviously we're in the big 10, uh, College Park is, and then all the other schools are in different divisions. Um, so it's going to kind of focus, I think, around which athletes get endorsements. Uh, I was reading the other day that um, Alabama's quarterback already has a million dollars in endorsements. Um, so, you know, even though you think that, okay, it's going to be all the football and basketball players, I think lacrosse is going to be really big women's lacrosse is going to be very big because, you know, we've, we've had the Tawarton award winner, which is the equivalent of the Heisman for women, uh, for, and, you know, for Maryland for a number of years. Towson's a great lacrosse school. 
Um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, possibilities, but it's going to really focus, I think, on the athletes that can get endorsements. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, I think everybody's learning at the same time. Right. And then the bigger picture is, you know, I just I think you might have noticed that two teams just joined the SEC. Right. And, you know, that's all about the television revenues. Um, and so the other conferences just came together. Uh, I don't know if you read that and are saying, hey, you know, we got to be careful. We don't pick at each other's teams, you know. And is this um, all within the purview of the Board of Regents making determinations about this? So, for example, when the University of Maryland went from the ACC to the Big Ten, was the Board of Regents, I assume the Board of Regents was involved in that? Just in they were involved in it, yeah. Mm -hmm. They had to take a so vote. Those are the types of things you're going to be doing now. And there was, there was definitely some division, you know. There was some division on that because there were some people who were diehard ACC people, you know, who had the history. And then there were some people who said, you know, we're more of a Big Ten school like Michigan, et cetera. I'm just speaking of College Park now, of course, right. um, because we, we do have 12 schools. I don't want to seem too slanted, but, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how this all plays out with, um, you know, with the athletes. Well, maybe we will have you back after you have some seasoning <laughs> on the board to, to tell us how, because I think from a legal perspective, it is fascinating, you know, for those who are involved in being agents of, of athletes, all of a sudden you have a whole new crop of, of individuals, but there are a lot of uh, pitfalls for the universities and how they might deal with, with different scenarios. It's not as simple as, you know, a car dealer to the, to the athlete, you know, to, to attract, you, you can imagine a scenario where, where universities, not here, but would, would try to attract athletes in ways, right. utilizing, um, you know, quote, sponsorship opportunities. So maybe we'll have you back to talk about how that is going on both those committees. Let me take a step back. Your time as a Senator, because, because this is coffee and conversation with legislators and now two okay. former legislators talking. You were the chairman of the Capital Budget Committee on the Budget and Taxation Committee in the Maryland State Senate. For lawyers like myself, and I'll bet you many lawyers who might see this, that those words don't have a great deal of meaning other than knowing that the state has a budget. And so I want you to give kind of a 101, like about the budget process. We're more accustomed to criminal law, civil procedure, things of that nature in the Judicial Proceedings Committee. Talk about the budget process, the operating budget versus the capital budget, just kind of like a little bit of a 101 about how this budget process works in the state of Maryland. Okay, so at this time right now, we're in an interesting time um, because right now it's a very governor-driven budget. You know, the governor, we, we set certain debt limits. Um, we have to have a balanced budget. The governor passes down the operating budget and he passes down the capital budget. Okay, then it goes to, it rotates every year. So I think this year it's going to the Senate first. We amend the budget um, and then we send it to the House. They amend the budget and then the governor can veto either budget. Okay, now with the capital, he can line item veto, but for the, for the operating, you know, he doesn't have to listen to anything that the legislators have to set, okay? So let me back up for a second. So um, every year the Debt Affordability Committee meets, we set an amount of debt. The governor says, this is how much debt we should carry. The legislators say, this is how much debt. And the legislators can actually override the governor in creating the debt limit. Now, again, that's a guideline. You can go back and change it, but try to live within that debt limit. Um, and there's always that debate, you know, should we put more money in infrastructure, should we not, et cetera, et cetera. And that so, affordability makes the determination as to uh, the total amount of the state budget for that coming fiscal year? Yeah, the governor, and he has the secretary of transportation on there. He's got um, the comptroller, the treasurer. It's a group that meets. It's, it sets the debt limit. And then it goes to the legislature, which is the spending affordability right. committee. And, and we actually take their recommendations and make a final recommendation. And then that's how that's set up. So, so the capital is pretty cut and dry. You know, you have a certain amount you can spend. Um, and then, you know, you have the governor has allocated money to all these projects. And then the legislature can add to that or amend the governor's projects. Normally, we just take the governor's projects and add to it. Okay. 
And a lot of the legislators get involved with what's called bond bills. Each legislator gets a certain number of bond bills so they can go back to the community and fix the roof of the Lions Club or, you know, whatever, whatever projects they have, you know, in their area. It has to be a nonprofit. Okay, it has to be a 501c3, it has to be registered state to give a bond initiative to it. Um, la this year, I guess this year, we had the, the biggest capital budget in the history of, I think, the state because we not only had our money, but we had the federal money come down. So the federal money laid into our capital budget money and the operating money laid into our operating money. So we had a huge budget. Um, and um, you know the governor used a lot of his rainy day to take care of issues, obviously with COVID, with the restaurants closing down and, and, and other issues that, that impacted um, unemployment. And so then that federal money backfilled all the rainy day money. So we're, we, were, we started off beginning of the year, we thought we were gonna have a $4 billion deficit. We ended up having, uh, you know, we ended up um, with, with a profit in essence, you know, with, and so, because of the federal money. And if the infrastructure money comes down, you know, that they're debating right now at, at Capitol Hill, that will be millions of dollars to the state to put towards bridges, roads, you know, that sort of thing. So what happens is the, the state lays out their budget and then the Fed money comes in during the legislative process during the 90 days and more projects are actually funded than you have originally planned, you know? Um, so, with the operating, the interesting thing is that um, let me let me stop off. you for one second and just and I apologize for this, but for, right. those, for those who are again like aren't used to these types of words, g give an idea. You know what? Obviously, capital budget are for construction type projects, roads, right. bridges, mm -hmm. building the roof of the Lions Club or whatever. Right. The operating budget is for those who don't understand what that process is. What 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 is comprised the operating budget, and then what are the what, what are the what are we talking about in terms of sizes of these budgets? Operating budget, let's just say personnel. You know, um, somebody described it once to me like uh, this is you know if this is if this is the capital budget. Your hand, anything that you turn over and falls out is operating. This this is a fifteen year plus investment, a building, uh, a road. You know, is a capital project versus operating. Which is operating would be the employees at the correctional facility, exactly, Department exactly. Of Health or whatever Department right. of Health Services. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, or programs, you know, that sort of thing. So the the, the operating is um, an issue which is going to be changed in 2023. So, remember, I started saying it's governor-driven budget. Now, there was a um, question on the ballot last year that said that the legislators can amend the operating budget. We never had that authority for many years. Um, and now what can happen is that the governor can say, we need to add 10 people to corrections, okay? And we can come back and say, we need to add 10 more people. And that actually sticks. Before, we could say we want to add 10 people and the governor's like, nah, we don't need to add 10 people. And that money that we set aside would just go back in the general fund. He did not have to spend any money related to any legislators changes to the budget. Didn't have to do it. And, and he didn't do it for, you know, for some categories he didn't believe in. He would just let that extra 10 employee money just go back to the general fund and they wouldn't add 10 more employees. But now he's got to do it based on the question that was uh, passed last year. But Maryland so has to have, unlike the uh, Washington, Maryland, correct me if I'm wrong, has to have a balanced budget, as you said before. Correct. So mm -hmm. in this new scenario, if the voters were to, uh, were, were to accept that proposal and allow the legislature to have a hand in budgeting for the operating budget, if you had that, just to take your scenario further, you have 10 additional correctional, you know, correctional officers that the legislature wants at a cost of X, would they then have to go find the savings of X somewhere else in the budget? Or do they, or are they able to kind of pass the buck back to the executive branch to find those, to find those savings? Or does that become a, an ugly political issue? It becomes, well, it, you know, you try to find the money, you know, you try to substitute maybe take from one department and give, get to another. That's the goal. 
because you don't want to try to increase the revenue. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that there's, there's these bond rating agencies, there's three of them that look at this every state every year. And if they see that, you know, the, it starts to get astronomical in terms of, you know, the governor wanting this and the legislator wanting this, and it, the budget just starts to explode, they're gonna downgrade our bonds. They're gonna downgrade our budget. So you have to be really careful to stay within the spending affordability committee like we talked about in the beginning. Otherwise- What happens if we don't? What, what happens if the state of Maryland, you know, all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's like legislators gone wild and, and the, everybody- This is starts. supposedly why they cut it off before is that the, the state went bankrupt. And years so that, and years, decades ago. That's why the good, they, they gave it back to the governor. But what happens is that the bond rating agencies downgrade us and we're more of a risky investment. And we have to pay higher interest rates on the bonds. Got it. Got it. All right. Back to the capital budget, which you were the chairman of. Um, so the capital budget are for projects, bond bills, things of that nature, as you were describing before. But can you kind of talk through some of like your accomplishments with this? I know that you just for those who <laughs> Doug won't brag about himself, Doug was known as a chairman of the capital budget committee that literally would go around the state looking at projects in every jurisdiction so that when legislators would call them and say, we need $200,000 for the Gordon Center, JCC, whatever, Doug would be, would come and see those things, would see the projects himself, which really had not been done before that, um, really was an active chair doing that. Talk about the capital budget. What's the size of it? You know, kind of give a, give a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one of that whole thing. It's about a $4 billion budget. Most of that budget is roads. You know, there's about a billion that, you know, are projects. Um, you know, I don't think there's any one particular one that I would point out, you know. Um, but I would say that what I tried to do was have everybody go home with something. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, it didn't matter to me. Everybody felt, I felt like everybody needed to have something to go home for, you know and with, and um, that's what I thought our job is, not to punish people, you know, but to help people. Um, and so, you know, what I did was, I, I think I visited probably 30 or 40 sites when I went out and just kind of got an idea on the ground of what the money was going towards. And then, you know, I was able to not just look at a spreadsheet and see uh, items come across. I was able to visualize, okay, well, yeah, I went out there and this is what they need. And, you know, sometimes you go back and say, hey, could you live with half of this this year and half of this next year? Because, um, you know, a lot of these are, have what's called a tail, which means, you know, you might have to put money in planning, but then you got to put money in engineering and then also construction. So it's not like you're just giving money on the front end. There's a whole tail to it, to a particular building. So, um, you know, I just kind of had to assess how we were going to phase it in in different parts. And, and, you know, interestingly enough, um, some projects would just not come to fruition. So then you had to take that money, reallocate it. And what I always tried to do is reallocate it within that district. You know, I just felt like, like Frederick, we had a, there was a big fight about a hotel in Frederick, you know, I remember. and we had $4 million in there. And then like a couple of years ago, the county decided they were going to take over that project. So that left 4 million in Frederick. And then I sat down with the two Frederick senators and we hashed it out so that they could each split that money and use it for their district. So that's what I mean by trying to keep it in that particular district rather than just take it and give it to another one. Um, I just thought that was fair, you know? Um, so that's, I tried to be fair, try to be across the board. And, uh, you know, if it was a worthy project, I know you worked on the Stevenson project. Uh, that was a great project. Um, there was extra land there, the, you know, our, our public and private higher eds are the economic drivers in the state. You know, you can see, uh, particularly say Johns Hopkins, they're buying block by block by block in Baltimore City, they just keep growing, you know? Uh, so they're creating jobs, you know? So that bill that, or the project we worked on together, you know, it was, it was a job creator, it was good for the university. And uh, so those are the kind of things you gotta look at when you, when you put the capital in. Makes sense. And so the, you say it's about $4 billion per year. For those you know, who might be watching this, you know, who are attorneys who spend their days in court and so forth, but maybe are involved in their extra, you know, kind of in, in outside of their legal lives in 
in nonprofits. Um, you know, how, how does one go about influencing, getting involved in, you know, they, they say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm working, I'm working with this 501c3 and it would be great to maybe we, we could use a capital budget. Like what, what, is, what is the process by way of which to influence that process? So what I tell people is, you know, first of all, it's gotta be 15 years or more. It's gotta be a building. It's gotta be something, you know, that, that's gonna endure 15 plus years. Okay, that's, that's the minimum requirement for, you know, for a capital project, okay? So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna write a letter to the governor and you wanna say, hey, I've got, stick with the Lions Club roof, okay? The Lions Club roof is $10,000. You write the governor, ask to see if he's willing to put that in his budget. And Secretary Brinkley and I have a great relationship. Uh, Bobby, you and I served with David, you know, in the Senate. Um, he understands how it works. He might go ahead and put that 10,000 in the governor's budget. Now, let's say he doesn't. So then you, you, you write another letter to myself or the house capital budget chair and you say, hey, I need this 10,000 for, you know, the uh, Lions Club roof. And you, you know, you write that letter to that particular senator or CC that senator, you know, so that everybody's on the same page. Now, if that senator or delegate makes it a priority, they'll go to their capital budget chair and fight for it, okay? So you could get the 10,000 from the Senate or you could get the 10,000 from the House. So you have three bites at the apple to get the $10,000, okay? Now, sometimes if it's a big project, let's just say it's a million dollars, okay? Maybe the governor will put in 500, maybe the House will put in 250, maybe the Senate will put in 250, you know? So that's another way to kind of split it up in terms of the project. But first letter should go to the governor requesting to put it in. And then the following letter should go to, to, the, to the senator for that district with a CC to the capital budget chair in the house and the, and the delegates. Makes and sense. You gotta, you gotta make sure your 501c3 is registered with the state of Maryland and it's in good standing. Because- And how do they, and, and so for example, so somebody goes and then goes, they, what do they, so somebody needs to build a roof, let's say, and then they have to, show receipts in order to get that right. money That's yes. how, and they send the, the paid receipts in in order They'll to get reimburse them. right mm -hmm. reimburse interesting we could i could spend all day educating myself about this I, for those who know i sat next <laughs> to senator peters on the on the budget committee for one year and he uh he he kept me informed of what was going on before we moved to jpr but uh, I, I tried i tried Bob. <laughs> You just told me to vote no on everything, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, I do want to move though. This is fascinating. And for those who might have questions, like, you know, obviously Doug is, is not the capital budget committee. The new budget, the new capital budget committee chair is Craig Zucker from Montgomery County and right. the, chairman of the budget committee, Guy Gazzoni from Howard County. But uh, these are really interesting issues and points. And I think things that most lawyers don't have a great deal of uh, expertise or knowledge in. Um, and it, it's something worth, worth knowing. I do want to move to some of your other accomplishments that were outside of the budget. Um, so I want to start first with, you were the chairman and actually, I believe, formed the Veterans Caucus in, in, uh, in the Senate. Is that an accurate statement? I did not form it. I was the Senate caucus chair. It was a House caucus chair, and we co-presided over the caucus meetings. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you, you've done a number of things in that, in that realm, including veterans tax credits and so forth. I wanted to ask you first about um, something called the Lieutenant Richard Collins Scholarship. I know that that was a big, I recollect that was, that was a big issue for you. Uh, can you talk about what that was all about and, and, and where that stands now? As many of you know, that was a tragedy. Um, he was a Bowie State ROTC. Um, student and he was killed in College Park. Um, it was, I think it was brought forth as a hate crime, but that was dropped because we didn't have that language in the hate crime at that time. It's now in there. It's a separate bill that was passed. But um, I was approached by the family who wanted to um, do something positive, which is always amazing to me. Uh, I don't, I couldn't do it. I mean, it'd be very hard for me to do that, you know, and, uh, but they, very spiritual people came and said, you know, we'd like him remembered. So I met with um, Vicki Gruber, who was uh, President Miller's chief of staff at the time, and we crafted a bill and um, we made it specific for historically black colleges and universities. And 
For those of you who don't know, we have four of them in the state of Maryland. We've got Morgan, we've got Coppin, we've got UMES, and we've got Bowie we State. So we set aside a million dollars in uh, operating, operating months, right? Okay. And um, we allocated the amounts to 25% um, minimum to each school. And then at the, we just, I changed the law. I think it was, yeah, I changed the law this year because some of the money went unspent because some of the, like UMES, I think they work with, uh, they didn't have an ROTC program, and um, and Coppin works directly with um, Morgan. So, bottom line is that you were, you know, these two schools didn't get anything, and we ended up only spending seven hundred fifty thousand. So, we changed the law so that the whole million would be expended because you might, you know, might have more students at Morgan and Bowie State who didn't get scholarships, which which was a shame, you know. So, we fixed that. Um, so, bottom line is that that's every year there's a million dollars. Uh, every year there's um, been graduation ceremonies and every year, like she said, and he said, you know, the parents, they've come to every single graduation and shook every kid's hand. It's an amazing story. And his name lives on. Um, and uh, he just, you know, he posthumously got uh, promoted. He was a second lieutenant and now he's a first lieutenant. So it's a lieutenant, uh, first lieutenant Richard Scholarship. Uh, Richard Collins third scholarship fund so that was a very powerful to me way of turning a negative into a positive and it was all because of those individuals um, who uh, you know who came forth and turned like tragedy into triumph it's great it, you know it's it, it's it's fascinating because you don't hear these are the types of stories you really don't necessarily hear if you know every day you turn on the news you would think that everything is awful and everyone's fighting and everything my, my my recollection is this this was a unanimous bill that you brought forward and and everyone was pretty enthusiastic about it, excited democrats republicans working together like these are the types of stories you don't hear in the news necessarily but it's, a, it's an incredible story um of turning tragedy to triumph so um i i know that you were involved this past session uh your committee was involved in doing sports gaming but before we talk about that a little bit take a couple steps back because I my because uh, my recollection is you were deeply involved in the very first um, issue of, of gaming which was the MGM bill and and that whole process again another all these things going through your budget and tax committee so can you talk through that I know it's been some number of years and you know how's the state doing with all this that now that we're moving into sports gaming you know to kind of take a step back to where we were before we had any gaming in the state of Maryland well, this was a real initiative of President Miller. You know, he saw the um, revenues that could be generated from casinos and he saw other states getting on board and Maryland not. And, you know, the bill was crafted. You know, I think, uh, Bobby, when you were on there with, with Governor Ehrlich, That's right. that slots for tots bill, I remember, right? And it died, didn't make it, you know, there was a couple of years. So President Miller was adamant that this bill was going to go. And so we ended up having a, a number of casinos uh, in the original bill. And um, then it became apparent that, you know, we were missing a big chunk of revenue in Prince George's County. Um, and uh, we decided to put in a bill, which I put in. Uh, now, I'm not a gambler. Uh, at all, but I, the fact that people actually, you know, got to vote on it, I thought was important. And so we put the bill in with two constraints. Um, one was that you had to have over a majority of people vote for gaming across the state of Maryland. And I put an amendment in that said over 50% of Prince Georgians had to vote for that. Now, you know, we have a very strong religious community in Prince George's County, and they have in the past really been vocal about, um, you know, against the casino bills. But, you know, I, they, they basically did not take a position on, on the bill, and the bill passed. Um, and uh, now we have MGM. That uh, MGM was the result of Rashern Baker. 
uh, he went out and he found a, a, a blue chip, you know, five star group that came in. Um, and there was a fight between Rosecroft and MGM, you know, Penn National. And the campaign was brutal. Uh, each, each side spent $40 million, you know, during, during the process. Um, and uh, it prevailed, like I said, over 50% statewide and over 50% for the county. And now it's, I think it's the number one casino in the state, MGM is. It's part of a group that generates over $500 million a year. We have one of the highest uh, quote unquote education tax rates where it goes right to the schools. And it's, you know, now with sports betting, uh, table games, et cetera, you know, it just continues to grow. So, um, you know, it's been, it's been a winner financially uh, for, you know, for the state of Maryland. And so now that, now that we have, and then this, it was this past session that the General Assembly and your committee passed sports gaming. So how does that add to, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? And, and how does that add to what we already have in existence here? So the sports betting is really, um, it's not going to drive as much revenue as the slots. The slots are the big revenue generator, just like the table games. The table games are a way to bring people into the casinos, you know, to play the slots. Okay. So um, sports betting is, um, it, it's, it was a lot different in the fact that we, the, you know, I think that the, the, all the casinos will get sports betting, right? Um, but also there was, there was parts in the sports betting that really tailored it to get MBEs involved in sports betting. And that's a very important point that, you know, we've got to support our MBEs. And uh, so there was some language in there for MBEs um, but you know, you, you could have, um, you know, like in Frederick, there was, there was a, um, a, 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 a bar slash, um, on off track betting facility that, that will more likely get a license. There was a, um, um, a, I guess, I guess a, a boat that was in the Potomac, <laughs> That, that actually will have, I'm using the wrong language here, but that will ha potentially have a license. Um, you know, you, you'll have some uh, non-traditional areas that have, um, um, you know, gonna have licenses, but the driver there was, um, you know, revenue for the state, going to the education fund, education trust fund, which you and I both voted to put a lockbox on you can't raid that fund and use it for other purposes. It has to go to education. And um, the people voted for that, you know, in the public. And then, um, and so this will just continue to add to that pot. And, and the other thing is that all the other states are doing it, you know? So people are going to West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, DC, and sports betting. So, you know, we were kind of hole in the donut. So we had to fill that. Interesting. So, my, my guess is you'll hear that same argument now that you and I are in abstentia to uh, about about uh, cannabis legis you know legalization right. as well the next thing that everybody around us is doing but an in, in interesting thing to watch when is sports betting going into effect in Maryland I mean am I planning on going to a Ravens game this year and they're gonna have something at, at the stadium or or well, is this the, I think the, the language was such so you know they set up a commission to review ah, applications. Ah. So as soon as they review applications and give licenses, you know, they'll move forward. But I believe that there was a license set aside for Raven Stadium and also uh, FedEx Field. So you'll have your casinos, your two sporting arenas, um, and then you'll have, um, like I said, these other non-traditional areas, off-track betting areas. Okay. Well, it's something, something interesting to look forward to. So I want to, I have a bunch of things I still need to ask you about. We don't have a ton of time left. Let me move to uh, the one where lawyers will know something's coming on, on the ballot this year, due uh -oh. to the Herculean efforts of Senator Doug Peters, uh, we will have the opportunity to, to change the name of our courts. We've already changed the name of the, of the law library to the Thurgood Marshall library, I believe. Correct. And yeah. 
that that was done without with uh, without any controversy. More controversial was the issue of turning what is before known as our Court of Appeals into the Supreme Court of Maryland. How did you on the Budget Committee get involved in an issue like this? And and if you can talk a little bit about this issue. Okay, uh, I'll be brief here. So let me let me talk about the library first. When we renovated the the, the um, campus area in front of the state house, the Thurgood Marshall statue went from the campus over and was mounted in front of the courts of appeals. So his statue was there. So Judge Barbera said, I wanna keep this statue. No, you can't keep the statue, it's gotta go back. So that's how the library came, to come, came about was that I went over there and saw the statue there and we decided that we were gonna name the library after him in his memory, since his statue was gonna go back to, <laughs> to the campus. That's the story behind that. Okay. The story behind the Courts of Appeals, and it's the Courts of Appeals building, which I find fascinating because there's two appeals courts in there, right? So, so uh, uh, Judge Barbera came to my office with Pam Harris. They had unsuccessfully tried to put money in the budget to fix their building and and build a new building. They've got some uh, uh, land right there by Navy football stadium. And uh, the governor kept kicking it out and saying, now we're not gonna, you know, remember I talked about the tail in the beginning, start the planning and then you got the construction. Well, it had a huge tail, you know, had planning money was not that much, but the construction was huge. So I put it in the budget. Um, I got about half of it that year. And I went toward the building, it was a disaster. I mean, when you walk in there, it's the, the, it, the carpet looked like a bowling alley. It's like blue carpet. And then everywhere I went, there were leaks. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, the building was just, it was a horrible building. And she kept saying, look, this is where we swear our lawyers in. This is embarrassing. We're the top court in the land, you know? So the second year I was able to get the planning money in. And then finally the governor relented and put all the money in for construction. So they have all their money in to build a new building. So as part of that, she said, look, I really want to change the name to the Maryland Supreme Court. Now that we have a new building, we need a new name. And it's, I, I, what really bothers me is I go to a cocktail party and I can't explain what I do to people. It's just, you know, Court of Appeals, Court of Special Appeals, people get all confused and wear red robes instead of black robes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So she said, you know, would you be willing to sponsor this bill? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I'll put it in, you know? So I put it in and, and yours truly here, you know, um, Bobby Z, chair of, uh, you know, JPR pounded me. This is not good. This is stupid, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I said, totally I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. So then all the traditional lawyers came after me and said, you're ripping down history, including President Miller. You're tearing down history. I said, look, all I know is I'm doing what Judge Barbera asked me to do, you know? So <laughs> the bill calls for a vote um, on the ballot uh, this coming this November to change the name to, you know, the Maryland Supreme Court. And I think it's the appellate court, right? I think they call it the appellate court for the, because she, she didn't want to still use, she didn't want to use the appeals name, right? It, because it would get too confusing historically with all the data, you know what I mean? And you'd have this Court of Special Appeals, Court of Appeals. So I think, I think she called it the appellate court. I have to check, but um, I'm sure somebody here online will know more than I, but that's going to be the question on the ballot. If you say yes, which I hope you do, I hope you have a change of heart. Uh, then um, the, the name would change. She would be happy. She'd have a new building. She re she retires, as you know. She's coming up here to retire, and I think uh, next week, I think, is her yeah. ceremony. And um, and so we'll we'll have given to me, my opinion, the dignity that that court should have a, a brand new building and a, a new name. And you know, so I'm, I'm I was pretty proud of that. So I hope everybody votes for that. So, so you're, so on the ballot, this is, and it's going to be in this coming election. Right. Um, they, the, uh, the name change for the, both the court of appeals and the court of special appeals as well will be on right. the ballot this year. So. Right. I mean, she wrote the question, you. just so you know, I, I, you know, she, she drafted the question. 
So I'm not going to ask you how we're going to change all of the, the hundreds of years of how you cite cases <laughs> and things of that nature now that we will, assuming if people uh, inadvertently say yes to that question, the, the, uh, it'll be interesting to see how we now cite cases. Will they have to go backwards and call it something different? It, it, I, I haven't followed it, but it's, uh, it's an interesting, uh, it definitely was an interesting and controversial piece of legislation. And uh, it was good, always good to see you in JPR on that one. <laughs> I know. You like to make me sweat. That's okay. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, it's a big deal, actually. I mean, it's, yeah, no. it, it's a big piece of legislation and it's a big change for the legal community. If we were to change the name, I mean, it seems like a simple bill to change the name of, of the court, but it is, it is a big piece of legislation and a big ballot initiative coming up. On it. So, um, so we've got only a few minutes left. Um, I know that there were a whole bunch of things I wanted to ask you about the Prince George's County tax credit, the ARC bills, which you know about virtual learning, which I know you were involved in. Um, you know, is there anything kind of that I have, you know, maybe, maybe I'll just leave this as an open question before I get back to Richard to, to close down the discussion. You know, what is it that I haven't talked about today that uh, in terms of legislation um, that, that you would want people to know about kind of your, your time in the General Assembly? Well, in inevitably, you know, people will come to you, people will come to me and say, you know, do you miss it, right? And I'll say, well, I miss the people. I mean, the legislation's very important. It's groundbreaking in a lot of ways. You know, I, I think our HBCU settlement bill was, was a phenomenal bill. It was unanimous. Um, and, and, you know, we're making a lot of, of strides, I think, to right some wrongs in the past. Um, but, you know, when people ask me about that, I always say I miss the people. You know, there is a collegiality there. Um, you, you'll make some lifetime friends. You know, you're working on really tough issues. And, uh, you know, I consider you a lifetime friend, Bobby. You know, you and I worked together for 15 years. Um, and there's people who I've continued to get, keep in touch with. But to me, you know, it was about, you know, having an issue, wrestling with that issue, respecting your, your opinion, you respecting mine, and us coming up with a compromise, which I think is what it's all about. And I think we've done a good job in the state of that. We haven't become so polarized as it is in Washington. You know, we, we still work together. The budget was a unanimous vote, Republicans and Democrats, which is unheard of. Capital budget was a unanimous vote. So, you know, we, we are working together, you know, in, um, in the General Assembly in the state. And that's what I'm, I'm proud of, the friendships I made. And, 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 you know, being able to make everybody successful, especially through the capital budget. Everybody came home with a little bit of something that they could brag about. And that to me was what it's all about. Do you, do you get the sense that, I know you were walking out the door and you have to be a little careful, but, but, but do you get the sense of some, you know, I've interviewed a number of folks on here and there's kind of this, this growing, I don't know what the right word, dread that, that Washington seems to be creeping in. We always prided ourselves. It was always a phrase in Annapolis. We're not Washington. Like when we did justice reinvestment, which was huge, uh, criminal justice reform. That was a unanimous vote yeah. in the mm -hmm. state Senate, which was unbelievable considering the, the details of it. Same that was, that was your legacy, which was phenomenal. Yeah. Same thing with the budget and, and all. It, the, the sense is that things may be changing, you know, a little bit of the creep from Washington coming, yeah. to, coming to Annapolis. Is that your sense? Do you think that's happening? Do you what are your thoughts on no, that? I mean, I think I think things have, I mean, have become more polarized. Um, and uh, a lot of people like myself, yourself, others who are considered moderates, um, you know, it's it's hard because, you know, people are playing really hard to the left and people are playing really hard to the right. And um, I do think it's healthy to have moderates, but we are far and few between now, you know. Um, and so I'm concerned about that. I think there is more and more of a divide. And I think you're gonna see that in November with the state elections, you know, where the governor is um, termed out. You got uh, uh, multiple candidates in the party, the Democratic side, and you've got a couple on the Republican side too that are gonna define themselves either as 
you know, far right with Trump or kind of middle right. And then you got people who are left. I mean, I know there's even a, in some counties, there's a democratic socialist party, you know? So, I mean, it, it's, it's just the moderate group, the middle, middle ground is, is really uh, of concern because like I said, you know, we've had all these different issues that uh, we've come together on. And I just hope we don't get to a point where there's filibusters and, you know, all kinds of games being played and things like the justice reinvestment and things like the Lieutenant Richard Scholarship, they, they become part of the, you know, part of the fodder in the battle versus us all coming together unanimously voting for them. Oh. You're here on, on, on those sentiments. Hopefully uh, we can continue to keep the wall between Annapolis and Washington, DC. All right, we have come to the end and run a little bit out of time here, but I just wanna thank you, Senator Peters, one of the most successful legislators in, in, in the last few decades, really quite quietly, your, your imprint on the state in your 15 years in the General Assembly and for many years before that on the City Council and the County Council in print, out in Prince George's County, your imprint on public service um, is immeasurable. And I just, you know, on behalf of the Maryland State Bar Association, want to thank you for your incredible service to the state of Maryland. I know it's not stopping. It's, out, it's only probably going to get even increased now with your, uh, now that you're on the University of Maryland Board of Regents and the UMMS Board. But uh, just on behalf of the State, uh, State Bar Association, just want to thank you for all those years of service and for your incredible work that you've done for the citizens of the state of Maryland. I appreciate you having me on your show. And um, I see a lot of friends up here who are watching. And uh, I, I'm just thankful to serve. And I uh, um, hope I did. I hope I, hope I changed some people's lives and helped some people. To me, that's what it's all about is helping people. Well, you certainly did that. Doug, thank you so much. Richard, let me turn it, turn it back to you, if I could, just for a uh, closing remarks, and then we will, uh, we will call it a day. Sure. I, I would like to highlight a couple of things that Senator Peters talked about. One is uh, the change in the law that would allow the General Assembly greater input into the Maryland budget, because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that Maryland had the strongest executive budget system in the country where right. the governor basically <laughs> controlled pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and now the General Assembly has a little bit more say in the matter. The other thing is, if I, I know probably most of you have never seen a subcommittee read out to a full budget committee, but it's one of the most amazing things you will ever see, the mastery of detail that the subcommittees and the subcommittee chair, like you, Senator Peters, uh, have to have to report out on the great detail that is in every aspect of the budget is just amazing to watch. And I want to thank you for all that you did, especially in that regard, because it, it just really was amazing watching you work. I appreciate it. Well, listen, everyone, uh, thanks again for, to all of you for coming, and I hope you'll join us for our next uh, Coffee and Conversation with Legislators, uh, and we will uh, get that publicized on the website and through mailings. And Shelly, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a wonderful morning. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Yep. Talk soon, man.